All right. Amen. Uh, Terry uh, was able to watch Sunday online and uh, said that it blessed her heart, so that, that's always a good sign. I, I had the privilege uh, Monday in the office to tune in uh, and, and look at the majority of it. Uh, Rosalie Castleberry, who was not here, uh, I discovered a message after the service from her that said, oh, Brother Greg, I regret that I'm not going to be able to be there. That was the daughter of Brother Metters, who was one of the pastors, and uh, is related to V.B. Castleberry, who was the, the planter the, uh, during that uh, first two years. And she said she watched, she goes, I've spent several hours today watching the entire, both services, man alive, I wish I was there. And uh, so it, it's, been, it's been a neat response, okay? I want you tonight, uh, we're going to look in two places that may seem odd to you. This Sunday morning, I'm going to preach a message entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Okay? And kind of uh, build on this past Sunday. Well, tonight, I want us to look, I want us to go to the book of Numbers, okay? So go to the Numbers in the Old Testament. Chapter 20. And, you know, I talked about Moses in the, in the message and the burning bush and, and running and God getting his attention and his surrender to uh, get back on track and, and go to Pharaoh. And he had all these questions to God about why he could not do what God wanted done. And God always had an answer for it. Uh, Moses' life as a leader uh, dealt with doing things God's way. All right? Uh, doing things God's way. For instance, I don't have any problem with a parent lovingly disciplining their kids and making them do things. Because, thank you, Jerry. Because if you do not lead your children when they're young, don't you expect them to obey you when they get older? Okay? Well, Moses had to learn that he had to do it God's way. And there was a tremendous consequence for Moses not doing it God's way. What do we, what do we tell kids? Uh, we, we tell them, you'll find out as a teenager, I'll give you more freedom if you just do what I, if, if I can trust you. If you, do what I, if you do what you tell me you're going to do and go where you say you're going to go and, and uh, I can trust you and you'll get more freedom and more latitude and, and more uh, rope, right, to do what you want to do. Life will be better if you're obedient. Amen. Now, I think most of us as parents would say that. Think about our teenage years. And then... They don't listen and get in trouble, or we didn't listen and get in trouble. And then you hear the words, I told you. I told you if you'd have listened to me and done what I told you to do, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Give me your phone. That's, that's the language today they understand. Give me your phone. It used to be give me your keys. Now it's give me the phone. Well, Moses oftentimes would have to learn that God could be glorified most by listening to God. Okay? Now, let's start with verse 6, chapter 20. If you're with me, say amen. amen. So Moses and Aaron, keep in mind Aaron was his brother. Aaron was the mouthpiece that God would use for, to help Moses when he said, I can't speak well. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock. If, if you have a pen in your hand right now, circle, speak to the rock. Before their eyes, speak to it before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, 
Must we bring water for you out of this rock? It's almost as if Moses is setting himself up for a little failure with that statement. Right? And the Bible says in verse 11, he lifts his hand and strikes the rock twice with it, with the rod, and water comes out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drink. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. And I think if you were to go back to the bottom of verse 10, uh, it had been a better sign maybe if Moses was said, must God deliver water to you out of this rock? Verse 12 says, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. What are you saying, Brother Greg? I'm saying right here, God says to Moses, you're not getting into the promised land. With all the success that you have had, that I've given you, you're not going to be the guy. And it was simply over the fact that he did not do it the way God said to do it. Now, You shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. And I believe Moses is, you know, he was all in. His, his life was on the line. That This is God's plan. God continues to bless and deliver. And then to hear that, it had to just absolutely just steal his heart. So where does he go from there? They spend 40 years in the wilderness, and he can see it, but he would never get there. It would be Joshua. So based on that, based on this story right here that we know, I want you to turn in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. And here, here's what I want to talk about tonight. Turning to the next page of your life. I'm reading a book right now by Richard Blackaby on seasons, that we're always in a season. Um, for instance, some of us are in a season of grandparents, or some, some of us are in the season of retirement, or some of us are in the season of singleness, or some of us are in the season of empty nest um, that was one that really affected me empty nest both kids gone uh, when drew went to college his freshman year he went to wright state renee's brother had gone through a, a kind of an ugly divorce and he was living by himself in huber heights a nice home and when he, when we realized that drew was going to go to wright state kenny said there's absolutely no reason for him to pay lodging he can live with me in huber we tried to pay him for four years. He did not take a dime. Drew never came home. He never came home. Now, now I'm not talking about coming home to see us or to do things. I'm saying he never moved back home. His next move from there was into an apartment married. And I'm telling you, Renee said, I grieved. I would go outside and just build a fire and sit there and just look at it. And uh, it's because you all, all, our lives were always consumed with our kids being home. Okay, so seasons. What season are you in? Um, and as you turn the page, are you looking forward to what's in front of you? Now, Ronnie Floyd made a comment. I believe it was Ronnie, wasn't it? Or was it Fred? About good days in front of us. Why can't the best days now be in front of us? We've looked back and thanked the Lord. Uh, why can't the best days be in front of us? So in chapter 17, uh, you may think that this is an odd proverb, but I think it'll help us as we look at the next season or the next page 
of our lives. Here we go. Verse 1. Better is a dry morsel with quietness, with quietness, than a house full of feasting with what? Strife. Strife. Better is a dry morsel, better is just a little with quietness than a lot with strife. Now, when I think about wherever we're at in our lives tonight, when you think about the next page or the next day or the next week or the next season, here we go. Understand you make the greatest impact on the climate in the house that you live in. Is your house a place of refuge or a battlefield? I can honestly say this. I can, by the grace of God, I can say it as a boy growing up, and I certainly can say it as married to Renee all these years. I always look forward to going home. I always look forward to going home. And uh, uh, you'll say, well, Brother Greg, what makes your marriage great? Well, it's certainly not me. It's Renee. And, and I tell folks in marriage counseling, and listen to the whole statement, Renee and I have a great marriage, but it's not perfect. Anybody want to say amen? Because I realize who I am, and I realize how I can mess it up sometimes or, 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 or get my feelings hurt or get defensive or sarcastic. That's kind of my, my tool of defense is sarcastic. Roy and Kathy will tell you, we've traveled enough with them. Uh, when Renee says he's doing it, they know exactly what she's saying. Okay? You make the greatest impact on the climate of your own home. Better is a little bit with quietness than a lot with strife. Number two, a wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. A wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame. Don't let the devil in the next season of your life bring shame upon your family through your life. Say, Brother Greg, what if I've already messed it up? You ready? I have learned that there are some words that help any situation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And folks, I doubt if there's any of you here tonight, but there are some people in life or there's some people in your family that have never asked for forgiveness their entire life. You'll say, well, they've asked Jesus to save them. I believe if you ask Jesus to save you, there will be times when you ask people to forgive you because we all mess up. And, and the universal love language, listen, is I'm sorry, and there's nothing greater than grace when you say, I forgive you, or I've already forgiven you. Okay? Don't let the devil use you to bring shame upon the family. Okay, Brother Greg. What about somebody who's brought shame to our family? God, give me grace to love them. Um, scripture says if you continually pour it on somebody who's made a mistake, you can overwhelm them with their guilt. Um, I love it. I love, I love the fact that when I pastor a church that there's an elephant in a room and somebody feels like they've got to be the one to say it's here. Everybody sees it, everybody knows it, but I want to make sure that everybody hears me say it. That's not grace. The Bible says grace is overlooking fault. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we're freezing, go turn the thermostat up. I'm saying that there are times that you can make the situation better by just showing some grace to people. Listen, and that starts in your family. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Does it not? Oh, Brother Greg, I love my church and I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I can't stand my own sister. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that there's been difficulty in your family, but don't let the devil keep it that way forever. Life is too short. So Solomon writes, A wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame. Who will? A servant. So to me, Solomon's saying that a son can lose his rightful place by being foolish. 
and, and that servant will share an inheritance among the brothers. Number three, I love this one. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the what? Hearts. Hearts. Number three, put your heart into everything you do. Everything you do. Um, Bill, you mentioned this passage. It's not the one I'm thinking of, but it's somewhere else. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You guys use that passage. Where else is that? Okay. Uh, the one I like, it's, it's uh, Colossians 3.17. Okay. It's three it says the same thing. Yeah. Whatever you do. Okay, do all for the glory of God. Oh, that's everything. Um, put your heart into everything you do. Um, we, uh, we started our soccer season last, week, uh, last night, actually Saturday. If you want a meeting with me on Saturdays this fall, you're going to have to sit in a lawn chair next to me at some kind of ball game. Amen. Uh, we started last night Kobe's team. Kyle's helping. They didn't think they were going to have a very good team. Last night was their first game. Played to Eaton, and we won eight to nothing. Wow. No, this is the better news. You ready? One kid on our team had six goals. <laughs> I've never seen a little kid handle a soccer ball like this in my life. Guess what? He's on our team. <laughs> He's on our team, right? So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm liking our team because we've got, we've got a leader on that team. I can tell this kid loves to play soccer. He plays with his heart. And by the way, just a side note, just a little while ago, Hamilton West Little League won again, and Jerry and Kathy Banks' son, J.J., pitched six innings, Scoreless baseball. They're up three to nothing. He got to his pitch limit, so he, he, uh, and a guy had doubled off of him. So there's a guy on second. He can no longer pitch because he's hit a certain number. The first pitch from the next guy, kid hits a two-run homer. But Hamilton won three to two, okay. and J.J. was the star of the game. Man, I'm telling you, we got, we got famous people right in part of our church. And I, I told her, I said, when he gets home and settled, I'm going to bring him up here, and we're going to recognize him, and I'm going to have him sign a baseball card because I guarantee he's going to be in a pro someday. He plays with his heart, right? Um, we talked about this today. Do you, do you like to teach? Do you like to lead? Yeah. You know who does with their heart. How many times have you seen a parent drag their crying kid back onto the field because they don't want to play? And I think sometimes we try to play vicariously through our kids, maybe to make them be something that we wish we'd have been, but I'm telling you, not every kid is cut in the mold that we might think they should be when it comes to doing stuff. Aiden is in the band this year. First time, first ever. Guess what his instrument is? The most quiet instrument that you might be, the drums. The drums. Now we're going to see if his heart is in the band. Okay? Put your heart into everything you do. And I believe if you do that, when you get through it, win or lose, you, you'll not have regrets. You'll not have regrets. Um, number four, verse four, an evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Number four, always be a person of truth. When you look at the next page of your life, you'll say, well, Brother Greg, I've messed up in the past because I, I lied or I didn't tell the truth. Hey, that doesn't have to be the course of the next page of your life. That doesn't have to be the next chapter. That doesn't have to be the next season. Number five, 
He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Right. Number five, never make fun of those who struggle. Never rejoice in somebody else's misfortune. And we, and we, can, we sometimes, sometimes secretly we can, we can think, ah, oh, oh, I, I knew that would happen one day. And, and Solomon says, don't rejoice when something bad happens to somebody else. Hey, folks, I didn't realize how bad the flooding was in Tennessee until I got home Sunday afternoon and watched the news. We've got, we've got disaster all over the world. All over the world. Uh, verse 6, one of my favorites. Uh, is this highlighted in your Bible? Is it circled in your Bible? Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. You know what I love about that verse? Children's children are the crown of old men. They're talking about our grandkids, aren't they? The glory of old men. The crown. Number six, don't forget your parents and your grandparents. How many of you um, lost your grandparents when you were young and really don't remember? Maybe, is there anybody here that doesn't remember a grandparent? Okay. Yeah, my, my grandfather wow. died when I was about three, and the other one died before I was born. Okay. Did anybody here lose your parents young? Did you, Murph? I was eight years old. Oh. I had a heart attack at 42 and left my mother with six children. Oh, boy. Wow. Mm. The uh, that humbles you, doesn't it? My my kids, my grandkids will remember my mom and dad, great grandparents. I don't remember my great grandparents. For us, seeing my grandparents was a vacation, usually once a year, sometimes to Tennessee more than once. And the road to Tennessee always ran one way; they never came to Ohio. But the Bible tells us to don't forget those that came before us. Um, a young man from a wealthy family was about to graduate from high school. And it was custom in the neighborhood for parents to give their graduates a car. Now, I don't know about you all, I graduated in 1980, and in 1980, they, we didn't have big graduation parties. You might get a card from somebody, but certainly not send out a, an invitation that we're having a party and a big cookout and, and all that stuff. That came along like to, in the next generation. Right. Uh, so uh, he was about to graduate, and could you imagine it was custom in the neighborhood for everybody to give their graduate a car? Uh, Bill was his name, and his dad had spent months looking at cars. A week before graduation, they found the perfect car, and Bill thought, this is it. This is the one that dad's going to give me. And you can imagine his disappointment on the eve of his graduation when instead of handing him keys, his dad handed him a Bible. He was angry. He threw the Bible down, stormed out of the house, and he and his dad didn't speak. The only thing that brought him home was the death of his father. And as he went through his father's possessions that he was going to inherit, he came across the Bible that his dad had given him that he had thrown at graduation only to open it and find a cashier's check for the car right. that he thought he was going to get. Right. I'm telling you folks, parenting is sacrifice, is it not? You never know what's going on. Going on. You know, my dad worked at a factory for 25 years. He lost his job after 25 years. A place, a place in life where a lot of people might start thinking about retiring. Uh, McCall's went out of business and he was only 44 years old, my senior year in high school. 
the options were if you want to continue working what was then called Dayton Press, you were going to have to relocate to Frankfort, Kentucky. Otherwise, you would lose your job. And I remember him and mom praying about it and dad saying this. This is Greg's senior year in high school. We're not going to move anywhere. And he did whatever it took. And by the grace of God, he did, he did paint, interior painting. He's a good painter. And, uh, and then uh, a door opened up for him to be a custodian at the middle school. And that's what he did for 20 more years. Um, parents sacrifice. And oftentimes nobody says good job. Many times they don't even say thank you. And the whole time, the card was in the Bible because you're trying to do something better for them and they didn't even realize it. Okay, verse 8. All right, or we'll read 7 too. Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a, a prince. A present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Number seven, be a giver. Be a giver. Look for ways to bless other people. And I think God will honor that. Uh, verse 9, he who cover, this is kind of what we talked about a minute ago. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. He who covers a transgression seeks love. Not only be a giver, be a grace giver. Be a grace giver. What are you saying, Brother Greg? I'm saying cut somebody a break. So who in your life do you need to let up on a little bit? Maybe somebody, been, it might be a kid. It might be an adult kid that's made bad, bad decision after bad decision. Help us to not only be givers, but grace givers. Verse 10, rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. Number nine, be a lifelong learner. Amen? Never, never act like you know it all. And when I think of this, this first part of chapter 17, it reminds me that in the next page, the next chapter, the next season of life, I've got work to do. I don't know it all. God help me to be a grace giver. Help me to, to, to be a giver. Help my heart to be clean. Help me to respect my parents. My grandparents are gone. Never make fun of someone who struggles. Never rejoice over somebody's misfortune. Hey, let's take that into the context of a church. Never rejoice over something that's happened bad in another church or, or, or something that's gone bad. Always be a person of truth. When you tell the truth, you can have a short memory. Put your heart into everything you do. Don't let the devil bring shame to your family. Understand you make the greatest impact on the climate of home. And I'll close with this. The student went to Amherst College. As soon as he entered, he did some things in his dorm, and then above the door, outside of the dorm, he put the letter V. He endured all kinds of ridicule because people didn't know what it meant. They just made fun of the boy who had the V above his door. He didn't pay any attention to it, but he never disclosed it, what the secret was about the letter V. Four years came and went by, and graduation day came, and he was appointed to deliver the valedictorian speech. Then the mystery of the letter V was revealed. It stood for valedictory. The letter on the door held before him during his four years the ideal of the goal that he set for himself. Now here's the question for us. His was to be the valedic, uh, valedictorian. What letter is above our door for the next season? Uh, the next page? The days in front of us. 
and and you say, okay, church door, what would we put? Well, sometimes we can put things like this, P for popular. I, I agree with the fellow who said, if you want to be popular, buy an ice cream truck. Um, you know, when they were talking about um, the houses that the church has bought over the years, we bought seven. And I can assure you that buying houses in a small town does not make you popular. So popularity is not what you've what you got to be after. I believe F would be there. F. Faithful. Amen? Faithful. And you can put that above your house door, and we can put it here above the church, but faithfulness demands waking up every day and saying, okay, Lord, I, I'm going to obey you. Not always easy. It's not always fun. But he didn't say it would be. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. What's the old song say? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Okay. And uh, I think this past week has been a good one to look back and just be reminded that God has been so good to us. He has been so good to us. And I look at some of you that are sitting here that weren't here 10 years ago, and I'm thinking God continues to bring quality people to us. He knows what we need. Amen? How many of you were not here 10 years ago? Okay, a few, right? A few. So he brings us together for his glory. Here's how I want to close tonight, okay? I want us to break into two groups, men and women. And if you come on Wednesday nights, uh, if, if you don't want to pray, then Wednesday night may not be the service you want to come to because we're going to pray. And uh, we'll have the guys go over there. Ladies can meet here. Somebody in your group, just be a leader. But here's what I'm going to ask us to do. Before we do anything about praying for other people, if someone in your group needs special prayer, you step in the middle of your circle and you pray around them, okay? And when you're done, you can go. So God bless you. Thank you for being here.